All right, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Plain Township Board of Trustees for Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. If everybody will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay. To start the ma ma matter off here, the first item on the slate for tonight um, is the 6 p.m. zone change hearing. And I am going to turn that over to our zone, zoning planning development director, Mr. Tom Ferrara. Thank you, Tom, the floor is yours. Eric, could we have that um, picture up on the screen? We have before you um, a request for a zone change. Um, the zone change went through the zoning commission and they voted unanimously to approve the zone change and sent that recommendation on to you. Uh, fire department did not have any recommendation. The RPC recommendation was um, a denial. Um, their biggest concern after reading their, their write-up on it was um, that the re rezoning the subject property to I-1 light industrial is a significant change for the neighborhood. Um, and they recommended it stay a B2. But the change is really um, not that significant to this neighborhood. Uh, if you look at the map that we've got up on the screen, you can see where on the top Fisher's Market is. Um, if we, uh, Eric, can we scan down to the bottom? If we go down one block from Fisher's Market, we end up a little bit farther if it goes. Okay. Um, United Architectural Metals is on Cleveland at Orion. They are a manufacturer. Um, as you know, they, they manufacture glass and steel for very large glass buildings. Uh, they are an, an I-1 manufacturing uh, in a B-2 area. Uh, these were all grandfathered in, that's why they are there, but uh, they are an I-1. Up above it to the north, right next door, is Central Transport, where semi-trucks and trans uh, transfer station. Uh, in the picture, you can see the trailers, the semi-trailers, that are parked transferring their goods so, and the trucks go in and out all day. I don't know what time of night they might go, but again, that is an I-1 business uh, in a B-2 zone. Just north of that, you have the, um, a warehouse, hardware supply, where they have a warehouse and they distribute, or they did, from that warehouse, uh, hardware's supplies. I-1 business, a warehouse in a B-2 zone. So uh, with Fisher's going I-1, there really isn't that much of a change to the neighborhood. Um, we've already got those three large I-1 businesses there. Uh, we received, it's out of the picture now, but Caddy Corner to the northeast of the Fisher's Market, uh, there is a condominium complex that the, whole, the HOA president came to the Zoning Commission meeting and said he would, uh, he has no problem with um, 
Mr. Gilt's changing this to an I-1. Um, the thing he doesn't want to see is this building sit empty. We, if you look uh, back down towards architectural metals, off on the east side it are all condominiums. We haven't received any complaints at all from any of these condominiums uh, about noise or, or um, anything. So these businesses have been operating um, at a level that, that doesn't bother the neighbors. <clears throat> um, I think that is it. Uh, if you have any questions, gentlemen, and actually for the for the sake of this, before the board makes any comments, we need to check. Is there anybody on the line um, tonight that's wishing to speak in support or in opposition to this plan? I'm assuming it appears we don't have anybody else from the general public on the line. So that being said, we will start with board comments. I just want to lead off with, quite frankly, I, I'm extremely disappointed in re regional planning. I think they completely missed the boat on this one. They failed to look beyond the immediate par parcel because, I mean, relatively easy justification based upon things that are going on there. And I think longer term, the inability and or the failure to anticipate with the current economic situation and taking into account um, retail, retail space, how folks are reducing footprints, there's less of a need for these big, these big boxes. I don't want to be sitting here, you know, with an empty building and us potentially dealing with, you know, another Oakwood Square version 2.0 prior to the, re the restoration. And I think what makes this project all the more compelling um, to the township is, you know, the folks that have worked diligently in a timely manner to turn Oakwood Square around are the same individuals who are looking to perform this project and never once have we had a what I would consider a, mi a misstep or any major issues they've been uh, very colla collaborative um, so again the long term the long term risk I think was a major oversight um, by, by regional planning but I find this to be a desirable proposition in fact during the zoning hearing, it was noted that they expect the truck traffic to actually be significantly less than that of which the grocery store gets, not only in volume of trucks, but the timing of the trucks where, you know, with grocery, a lot of them are early morning, of course, with them, whether they're class A or class B trucks with the reverse, you know, beeping, I guarantee that's got to be more of a nuisance to anybody in the residential areas than what we're going to see with constricted hours. And the reality is it's still even taking into account, you know, what other uses could be done with this property pending an, appro an approval. It's not just about the immediate plan. I still think it's about whatever could still go in there in the future should the uh, current plaza owner wish to switch gears, make different inve investment choice. I still feel extremely comfortable with the other options that are out there. So that being said, I'm gonna look, Brooke or John, if either of you have any co comments or questions. I couldn't have said any better than Scott. You hit the nail on the head with the fact that we don't want another Oakwood Square situation where it just is abandoned and empty for years. And then like you had mentioned with the people who have 
provided all the buildings into um, Oakwood Square and revitalized it. We definitely know that they get the job done. They do hard work and they will make it into a growing and prosperous plaza. Yeah, I, I would think that uh, I would echo all those uh, considerations. One thing, uh, like I always do with these, I went up, I drove the neighborhoods, uh, I went on the backside because there's some places to actually get to that backside. You have to go around. Uh, there's not a direct connection to the neighborhoods in the back. So you have to go a considerable way. Uh, and I remember actually uh, what we did when uh, that uh, senior citizens housing went in up there because uh, I was fire chief then and I remember that. Uh, but the thing that impressed me the most about this that caught my attention was usually these kinds of changes are going to get a lot of participation and a lot of questions from the surrounding people and most of them are going to be negative. And in this particular case, it was just the opposite. The one and only one that we got was more positive than it was negative. So I think that goes a long way in us making our decision uh, when we go to move forward and vote on this. Is there any other co comments that anybody ha has? Okay, barring no for no further discussion on this matter, I'll make a motion that we approve the, uh, the zone, zoning application as it relates to applicant one GS eighty one hundred company LLC for the address of the property affected at eighty one hundred Cleveland Avenue, Canton, Ohio four four seven two zero. I'll second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Haas? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Okay. That will conclude the public the public hearing regarding the zone zoning amendment. So that will take us. We will now go to our agenda. And since we let off right with this hearing, are there I want to check, are there any additions, deletions, or corrections by fellow board members or department heads regarding the regular business agenda? I, I have none. I don't have any. Um, I've got two that I'm gonna put under concerns of trustees. One's Canton Township and two's Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame Marathon. Sir, uh, this is Tom Ferrar. I have one as well. Since we've already voted on this resolution, uh, yeah, that is the only item on zoning's docket at this time. So we can remove that. Um, okay. from Do we know change number one? Yeah. All right. Any, uh, any other changes? Okay, hearing, hearing none, the agenda will stand as amended. First item, new business, Ms. Campbell. Um, thank you, I'll actually turn that over to Mrs. Harless. Uh, what about, no, new business oh. number one, opening a blanket to various vendors. Oh yeah, um, I don't. Ha yep, I do have that resolution to open that blanket to various vendors in the amount of twelve thousand one hundred and sixty-nine dollars and seventy-two cents from Fund O One B O Two. I will so move on new business number one. Second. Discussion. Just a point of clarification: these are the insurance monies that have not come in correct as it relates to the water damage sustained in the zoning office and essentially to cover the cost of, I don't wanna say remodeling, but refinishing the zone, zoning office due to the damage. Yes. Yeah. 
Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Now new business number two. Uh, yes, uh, Jim, good to see you again. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce Jim Knight. He is the crime uh, prevention specialist with the Stark County Prosecutor's Office, as well as on the sex trafficking task force. And he wanted to give us an update on some crime prevention tips that we could use in Plain Township, given the recent uh, strings of scam calls, break-ins and so forth that we have going on. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you again to the uh, Plain Township trustees for having me uh, uh, share tonight. Again, I am Jim Knight with uh, Star County Prosecutor Kyle Stone's office. I'm the crime prevention specialist. And I just wanted, as Ms. Mrs. Harless said, to share some basic tips and things that you may want to share with the residents and offer whatever services that uh, we in our office can give, um, especially as it relates to home security. So we're just, I'm just kind of scratching the surface here. Uh, we go in uh, deeper with our presentations, but just some important tips to be aware of. They may sound common sense and you know, pretty basic, but at the same time, what we want though is for people to refresh their memories and to take those extra steps because while we can't ultimately prevent a crime from happening because if somebody wants to get into somebody's property, they will try to find a way but we want to make it that much harder. We can't prevent ultimately, but we can deter. And a lot of times that can solve half a lot of the problems. Most important around homes, uh, just very briefly, always, even if you're at home, lock all your doors, your front door and your back door, uh, whether, whether you're home or not. And the exterior door frame should be of a metal or solid wood with a, um, um, and also to keep your entry doors well lit both your front doors as well as your back porches. Lighting has always been known to be a good deterrent. If you can to have a wide angle door viewer, but if you're not expecting somebody when they come to the door, don't feel you have to answer it. Um, if it's somebody dropping off a package, they'll leave the package. And it's if you have a window by your front door, it's also not a good idea to put river rocks or other items, especially if somebody really wants to try and get in and they don't think that you're at home, they may try to, if they really want to get in, they may try to take the rock or the item and throw them through the window as a way to gain entry. And also, uh, don't keep a spare key under a flower pot or under a doormat. I know it may seem like it's convenient, but it's always a better idea, if possible, maybe give that to a trusted uh, friend or family member. Uh, as for garages, always keep, ha always have them well, well lit entries and solid doors. If you have items in there, if you have a window in the garage and it's a low garage, maybe consider draping uh, some of the valuable, some of the uh, like your lawnmower or other equipment that you may have in there. Whether you park your vehicles uh, inside the garage or outside, always a good idea. Obviously, remove your valuables, roll up the windows, lock the doors, even loose change, take those out. And if you park your car outside, as I will go back to taking your garage, your remote control garage opener, because that has been a known way for thieves that want to try to get in can do that. And it's even a good idea to do that even if you're at, when you're at home, even if in, you're in the backyard. A lot of times I'll come across reports where um, it's not the victim's fault by any means, but we, like I said, we don't want to make it easy for them. The garage door was left open and somebody may be in the backyard pulling weeds or mowing the yard. Somebody uh, sneaks in and takes what they want, especially if the keys are near their vehicle, they may try and take the vehicle. So obviously just make sure we always want to secure our stuff. As for lighting, uh, lighting, like I said earlier, excellent deterrent. Place on the yard poles or beneath the eaves of the house and always make sure that it's uh, shining at a downward slanting angle and try to clear shrubbery or trees or any other foliage away from the windows and doors so that it's not blocking the lights. And I'll never place security lights at a ground level and always make sure, it's always a good idea to make sure in case of emergencies that your house number is well lit, uh, especially in the evenings or if, or if a resident lives on a dark road, make sure that the, the, if the, their emergency, their, excuse me, their address numbers or any other part of their house is well lit. And also if you're not home, leave on some lights or even a, even a radio. Inside lights will help with the impression obviously 
that someone is home, whether or not, or they may, whether they're gone for the evening or on vacation. And speaking of vacation, a couple of quick things. You can check with your sheriff's office about getting a vacation check. Let them know when you're leaving and when you plan to be back. Obviously, if you're coming home early, uh, let them know, even, uh, let, definitely let them know in advance. Try to stop or, to, or have a friend or family member collect uh, mail or newspaper so that those don't start to stack up and leave a, uh, leave a suggestion. Also, it's in, the cliche unfortunately is true. Don't post on social media if you're going to be out when you're out of town while you're on vacation. Wait till you get back because sometimes thieves or criminals have taken advantage of that before. Uh, for window locks, you may want to install and check with a locksmith on good, strong, solid window locks. But it, most importantly, make sure that the windows are down. Keep valuables away from the windows so that they're not um, something that's going to, anything in there that's going to tempt somebody. Also, psychological deterrent, you may want to consider placing some large uh, gravel on the ground near the windows. This could be, as a, like I said, a psychological deterrent. And you can even put plants under the windows, but kept to a height that's below the uh, windowsill. And if you are gonna put plants in the window, if you wanna have a, I guess a little fun with it, consider putting the spiky thorny kind of plants. So these would be more, you know, be less likely to wanna hide under those. As for your garage sheds, um, obviously always leave locked and closed when, you're not in, when they're not in use and have a padlock to secure. And any outdoor furniture or tools and bikes have them in the garage or just leave them out of, you know, take those out of the yard and store them. If you can chain down, even better, put the serial number on your valuables because if something does happen, they are taken, that might be something that can help the sheriff's office out. And like I said, with the garages, if you have a window in your shed, consider draping a sheet or blanket over any of the mowers or any of the equipment. So if somebody sees, is able to still look in the window, they're not gonna really maybe see anything of value. As for alarm systems, the best thing I can say is just is do plenty of research, you know, get at least a couple of different estimates, more than one. And uh, you know, basic, you know, stick to the basics, whether you're going for more traditional or online base, and then check with law enforcement to, on any licensing requirements. It's always a good idea as well to keep your phone fully charged and by your bedside. And all, along with that, uh, you can always call 911, but if you can, put the uh, police department or sheriff's office's number, have that saved in your phone. And a couple of other things that you can do, post a security yard sign or a window decal, whether you have a, an alarm system or not, although I think it's probably better if you, if you can. Or if you can, I know it's a huge expense, but own a dog or a big dog with a beware of dog sign in front of the door. But if you don't feel comfortable going even that route, what you can also do, and if you live alone, place a set of big construction boots outside on the front porch. These are all, like I said, some psychological deterrents. And uh, from burglars I've heard before who have been you know, interviewed on TV, they also say leave a vehicle out in the driveway, whether you're home or not. If you have two cars, maybe consider leaving one vehicle out in the driveway, obviously, because that gives the impression somebody's home. But obviously, lock the doors, roll up all the windows, remove the valuables, and again, take in that, in that garage door opener. But um, like I said, I just scratched the surface. I apologize if I went a little, a little fast, but um, the best couple of the best things I can say to do is because I've heard from a former burglar, he was asked, what is the best thing that, um, that was the strongest deterrent? What really worked? And he said, more than cameras or uh, alarm systems or things like that, those are all great and, and utilize that, but really get to know your neighbors. Uh, that was a big one because they saw that they could tell that neighbors were watching out for one another. Um, what I mean by that is that the neighbors wouldn't confront them or put themselves in harm's way, but would be the eyes and ears of their police department. They were less likely to try to do something. They would go on possibly to another neighborhood. Because if they saw that, if nothing else, if somebody was walking around the yard suspiciously of, an, of one person's house, somebody at least, at the very least, just said, excuse me, can I help you? That, they, that would stop them. You'd think, oh, well, I, I, I must be too early, or I, they'd try to make up a story. Um, and then they'd soon leave. So not all maybe like that, but still, it can be an effective deterrent. And like I said, 
We don't ever want uh, neighbors confronting a suspicious person or trying to take off in their car after them. Just report what you see and know uh, from a safe place. You know, just keep, you know, be thinking about your safety first and just report what you know. Um, even if it's you get half a license plate, just turn that over to the police department, be their eyes and ears. Uh, finally, what I do, and I go into this in more depth, I've had the pleasure to uh, host neighborhood crime watch meetings in the Plain Township area. Um, I'm always still available to do that, even now through Zoom or, um, you know, eventually even when things return uh, to normal. Um, but we're always available to help out, um, to get, you know, to help to get those started. And we work with uh, Sheriff George Meyer's office and uh, they've been an excellent partner. So uh, we've really enjoyed working with all our law enforcement agencies that we have here in Stark County. And we just want to help out how, however we can. So um, I think, um, Brooke, feel free to pass along, you know, my information to everybody and um, that I'm, you know, I'm always available, answer any questions that they have, or if I don't know the answer, I'll try to help find out for them. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, speak with us. And I definitely took some notes. And as soon as we hang up and we're done with our meeting, I'm removing the colored rocks that my kids have drawn on the front porch because dad's right by the window. So <laughs> I definitely learned something tonight. Thank you. Wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, Jim, Jim quick question, yes. quick question for you. Based upon guidance, you know, historical trends, you know, most burglars clearly don't, don't want to be caught. And it used to be that folks are typically home, home at night, home at night, they're gone during the day. So you'd see right. more break-ins during during the day because they figure there's a lower statistical probability right. of being caught. But the challenge being within the last year, approximately, there's a lot more folks working from home. Are you guys hearing or seeing any difference in tre trends, you know, given more folks working from home? Are burglars becoming you know, braver and still attempting to try to do it while people may or may not. I might just speaking for myself, uh, just um, the, re, you know, the report copies will, you know, I'll see, I don't see a, you know, a specific trend uh, myself and, you know, the sheriff's office may be able to answer better, but what I'm, I am still seeing are uh, listed a lot of crimes of opportunity. Um, I'm still seeing a lot of times vehicles are left unlocked and, um, you know, valuables that are being left in the car. You know, one case, I mean, somebody had their laptop in their front seat. Um, so that's still a lot. What I'm seeing are crimes of opportunity that still has, that still has remained, um, the, the main thing I've, I've witnessed. And I'm not trying to say that people, if they're going to leave their doors or un unlocked or anything like that, they deserve what happened. Not at all. They don't, but, um, it's just that what, what I like what I was trying to talk about still, you know, even even today um, with the pandemic, we still, you know, being, you know, using our awareness and taking those little steps, just those simple things, just locking up our, our cars or locking up our, our sheds or things like that. That's going to be really our best defense. And sometimes I forget to do some of those simple things. So that's a that goes for me too uh, to take that extra step. Well, thank you again for your time this this evening. Um, that, that'll conclude the administrator or the new business. It's gonna take us to the fiscal officer's report and I'm gonna turn that over to Mr. Wolf. Thank you, fiscal officer number one is a request for resolution to authorize payment of penny warrants in the amount of $67,456.58. So moved. Second. Discussion, roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? You're on mute, John. Yeah, I was gonna say, give him a minute there. Sorry, you go. that is a yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fiscal officer number two is a request for resolution to authorize payment of regular payroll in an amount not to exceed 250,000. So moved. Second. Discussion, roll call. Mr. Haas? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Fiscal officer number three is a request for resolution to authorize payment for the following medical claims. So moved. Second. Discussion. 
Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Fiscal officer number four is the financial report for January. If anybody's got questions, feel free to see Tom. Tom after the meeting. Fiscal officer number five is the bank reconciliation. Okay. Good to go. Fiscal officer number six is a request for resolution to authorize a true up payment to the state of Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation in the amount of $17,071. I will so move. I'll second. Discussion. Hey, Tom, is this just because of like revised payroll numbers or something? I'm asking because, you know, the state's given out these credits back, back to us over the last couple of years. And I just find it ironic that there's a true up payment. Yeah, the way it works is for workers comp, you have to estimate what your payroll is going to be for the upcoming year. Yeah. Um, so then if the payroll comes in higher, whether it was hazard pay or um, something like that, then um, you have to report those excess wages and pay the premium on them. So would some of the COVID money that we, we paid in wages, that would, ha that would have an impact? Yeah, that would be part of it or any new hires. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they're still getting their money, but supposedly they're going to be reducing the rates um, for the upcoming year. Um, I don't think it's official yet. Um, so hopefully we'll see some savings, but in the meantime, we have to pay the true up payment. Understood. I just, it's, cra it's crazy that they would factor in, and I, I'm sure it's probably a smaller percentage for us, but to factor in, you know, true up off of any COVID related funds, you know, taking taxes on tax dollars that have been borrowed is just, lunacy at its fine at its finest from my perspective but definitely okay any further discussion roll call mr sabo yes mrs harless yes mr hawes yes fiscal officer number seven is a request for resolution to provide for the current expenses and other expenditures of the plain township board of trustees during the fiscal year ending December 31, 2021, the following sums be and the same are hereby set aside and appropriated for the several purposes for which expenditures are to be made for and during said fiscal year as follows. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Fiscal officer number eight is a request for resolution to authorize the following transfers. I'll move on fiscal officer number eight. I'll second. Discussion, roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Fiscal officer number nine is a request for resolution to authorize the payment and amount not to exceed $7,492 to be taken from 01A26Q to reimburse the Canton Municipal Court for Plain Township's proportional share of the operating cost. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Hawes? Yes. And that concludes the fiscal officer report. Okay, thank you. It's going to take us to our administrator, Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Item number one is a resolution to discontinue the extension of the Family First Coronavirus Response Act on February 28, 2021. I will so move. Second. Discussion. Yeah, the Roll board um, had extended it for two months. It's just... Um, after talking with all the department heads, a good time to just, you know, pick an end date for it. I would agree. I would agree. And what that translates to is if somebody would get sick or whatever, they've got to use their allocated sick, sick time or any other time that they have available to them. Exactly. So, okay. 
Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Okay, item number two is a resolution to reimburse uh, Royal Docks, uh, Fetter House and Kitchen in the amount of $22,116.97 for the COVID CARES Business Grant from Fund 14A 08V to be used on a reimbursement basis for the township businesses for COVID related expenses. I will so move. Second. D discuss discussion. I, it, is this money coming from the the what the what the county has? Because our yeah. prior meet our prior meetings, we had indicated that we had expended all re resources. Um, and so we where's this? Yep, we thought we had, um, and again, we were working at a fast and furious pace given the December 31st deadline, um, but when all of the calculations were done, all of the receipts, everything in, um, we have about $100,000 left. We're going to use the majority for um, park salaries um, in relation to COVID because they are um, once again, going to have to continue with the playgrounds and the bathrooms on a on an hourly basis like last year. And uh, Royal Docks did send in one more um, grant, and um, we do have the funds available if the board so chooses. Okay. Any further discussion? I have a question. What is the online order process servers? It says the invoices are attached and I do not have that. Well, they're attached for Tom to review. Okay. Um, she can attach them in here, but it, it's a new system that they use to be able to um, order online. So Brooke, hey, Brooke yes. have, you, have you been into any of the restaurants where they, they're not handing out the menus and they got that QR code oh. on the tables and stuff? Yeah. Okay. So you pull up your own med. That's essentially part of what part of what it is. COVID related. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. I just wanted clarification. It was COVID related. Thank yeah. You. And Tom and I, Tom Wolf and I had talked, and obviously they would have never done that, but for COVID. Um, and they're they're in a tough spot, having opened right when COVID started. So it, it seems like a, a a very good expense to be reimbursed. Well, well thank you, Scott, for that clarification. Yep. Yeah. You, you figure, so Lisa, we, I mean, just for the record, I mean, we've done essentially a little over $200,000 in small small business grants through, yes. through the COVID relief, correct? Okay. Yes, yep, absolutely. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. And item number three is just an update that we will be opening the offices back up to the public the day after President's Day, February 16th. Um, Mr. Haynes has already called, uh, worked that out with our vendor. So the doors will be open, will be open to the public beginning then. And then item number four is just a reminder that the next uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees on February 23rd will be at station three. Um, so far at six o'clock, we don't have a work session scheduled. So just a reminder to put that on your calendar. We will do another press release, uh, letting uh, everyone know that's where it'll be. We can still socially distance and that gives a chance for those folks on that side of the township to attend a meeting if they so choose. Like we did last time, did we send that over to the H? We sent that over to the HOI yep. as a heads up. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they distributed it for us. And then with that, that's the end of the administrator report. Thank you, Lisa. It's going to take us to the fire department, Chief Schallenberger. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, item number one is a resolution by the Blaine Township Board of Trustees, Stark County, Ohio, to promote Stephen Jokey from part-time status to full-time status, pending satisfactory completion of Ohio Police and Fire Medical Physical Wages and Benefits to be set by the Collective Bargaining Agreement. I will move on fire department number one. Second discussion, roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Um, item number two is a resolution by the Plain Township Board of Trustees to authorize purchase and payment of one DCU series truck cap and glide um, bed from RS truck caps 
for a Ford 150 pickup truck not to exceed $8,500. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Haas? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. And that concludes the fire department. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Road Department, Mr. Iacino. Chairman, uh, item number one tonight is a copy of the resignation from John Beeg that I received on February 2nd. Um, after talking with Lisa and the board, we decided that the Friday the 29th will be his last day. And Luther does did uh, leave the last day as the 29th for all benefits. We're good there. We're good there. And item number two, I received the 2020 Township Speed Zone studies that we requested through the Star County Engineer's Office. The first one was 55th Street between Kansas City Corporation Line and Middle Branch Avenue. The results came back at 40 mile per hour, which is the existing speed limit. We were trying to get that lowered to 35 once again. I do believe that's the second time we've um, put that through. And then we also had Bentler Avenue between Easton and On Street. Um, that result came in actually higher than the posted at 40. And the county engineer's office recommends we retain the existing speed as is. Yeah. Unfortunately that's just a stretch that's just a stretch of road given the straight straight shot. That's always a constant challenge. I know for the Sure, sheriff's office. So, I mean, even if it was posted down to 35 or something lower, still going to deal with those same speeding issues given the driveway access points. There's a couple of them that I could see as a homeowner are definitely a little nerve wracking, possibly pulling out if you're not listening and looking close enough. There is one dip there on Bentler that before you get to Han. As, as we all know, as we all know, it's not just a single factor. There, the state's got a crazy amount of multiple factors from road width and banking and line of sight. So, I have the complete that. study in my office for both of those. If anybody wishes, a pretty thick uh, study for each one. So, if anybody wishes. Okay. That's, that ends the road department report. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So do we have to we have, do we have to do anything formal? Because there's one sentence in here that says, uh, based on the above results, the Star County Engineer's Office recommends retaining the existing speed limit. So is are we to just uh, uh, historically there's nothing that it'll stay the same? Yeah, Histor John, it, it, it'll all stay the same. We won't. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, zoning that was removed. So parks department, Mr. Steinberg. Thank you, the only item for tonight is a uh, resolution by the Plain Township Board of Trustees to authorize payment to soccer one for some steel soccer goals in an amount not to exceed $3,675 from fund 14A08. I will so move. Second. Second. Sorry, this got, I'm not sure who, who, who beat who to the punch on that. That one, so Tom, whoever ends up in the minutes, we'll call it good. Okay. Um, as far as discussion, Rob, just a quick question for you. I know a couple of years ago, we ended up getting rid of a couple hits. And very heavy go very heavy goals, I think, that are over at Middle Branch Elementary. Now, um, I'm assuming these new ones mirror what we've already just got, a, got on site. I only asked the question because of the reference to steel. Uh, these are actually a little lighter. They're, they're as strong. They're probably a little more durable. Um, they're a little lighter and more able to be moved. Um, it's just the type of, of material that was used to make them. But, but uh, the goals that we have replaced them with, um, are sh we, we couldn't repurpose those if we wanted to or, or donate those. They're just completely shot from years and years and years of usage. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Hawes? Yes. 
Thank you. That concludes Parks. Okay, nothing for the law director or communications. It does bring us to the portion of the meeting, public speaks. Do we have anybody on the line from the general public that wishes to address the board of trustees? And if so, we would ask you to state your name and address for the record. It appears we have none. So we'll close public speaks. Um, next is concerns of trustees. And I've got two items here. I'm actually gonna go with number two first, which is Hall, Hall of Fame uh, mar Marathon. Been working with them over the last week and a half. They're trying to get their plans pull, pulled together. I know they've actually met with uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Carver al already. All seems good. We'll let Ryan speak to that. But um, they've also had sign off from the Stark County Health Department. Um, when I was talking with Jim, essentially this is like a bare bones stripped down uh, race, so they're not even encouraging folks out along the per, the uh, race, race route, um, whereas traditional races would have, you know, cups with water, everything is going to be bottled. They've cut the registration by, fi by 50%, and there's no race expo or post ra race party. So I'm bringing this up because like years past, um, this does go through a portion of the township over in the Avondale allotment area. Um, in an exchange with Jim today, he's asked that we put him on the agenda for next meeting, the 23rd, where he, he can come and present to the complete board the de details and so forth. Um, is we were chatting, he goes, they simulated their start finish protocols this past Sunday at the uh, Super Sunday 5K. So this is something that's just coming. This was intended to be uh, more, more so informational, but uh, for the sake of next meeting agenda, let's make sure we've got Jim on under new, bi new business at the front of the meeting. I've already made him aware that we're meeting at the center, or not central, but station three, so. Um, that being said, going to number one now that I have listed as Canton, Canton Township. Um, I've worked with Joe on, on this. Um, I was approached by Chris Nichols with Cant, Canton Township, essentially the section of 17th Street, um, which is over the, My, the Myers, Myers Lake air, area approximately. Um, they have approached us because there used to be an agreement. It was understood as a handshake agreement. Um, Joe's actually found some documentation that acknowledges there's a handshake agreement, but prior law director, um, Dick Kuhn, it doesn't appear boards of trustees for whatever reason, you know, put any more detail in writing outside of what the hand, handshake agreement is. Um, what they're looking for is trying to find a way to create greater par parity in um, co cost coverage. Um, essentially, right now, 17th Street Northwest, east of Broad, has been maintained by Plain Township since 1995. Um, I'm not going to get off into the me the measurements and so forth, but then the western side of 17th Street from Broad to Lakeside, Canton Township is ma maintained. And in their approach with us, um, you know, trying to get to greater parity, uncertain whether this is driven by their law director or if it's just simply their new public works director down there that was taking a look at this, but we need to be able to provide Joe with some direction on how we want him to draw out all the details here. A um, couple things, this just isn't about snow, pl snow plowing, you know, it, it's really the road maintenance too. And actually the road maintenance piece is 
probably the bigger part of it. Um, Joe had shared with me that in 2004 and again in 2019, we have repaved the section of that we've handshake ma maintained. Um, it's unknown the last time that Canton Township has paved their, their section. So that, that being said, you know, how we move forward, you know, we need, we need to ferret out some details here to give Joe some direction. Joe, do you want to add maybe a little more context just for John and Brooks? Yeah. Um, uh, we did, we did run some numbers and what we've spent so far on paving our section that we've been maintaining, um, which half is, the north half is in Plain Township, the south half is in Canton Township. Um, we have those numbers and how we pave and what uh, we, we, our specific way of paving and grinding. I'm not sure what theirs is. I cannot remember that road being paved in the last 20 some years. So we did it twice. I know they want us to contribute to some of the payment for them to pave 17th Street. I want to know, you know, how you want me to go about that. How much do you think we should contribute, if any? Um, once I, they, you know, we make that decision. I, I'm going to chime back in here, unless John or Brooke has something to say. You know, just for dynamics here, the reason this is split how it is is because if we just maintain the north lane and they just maintain the south south lane. You could have one lane that is completely plowed and the other that's not. You could have one lane that's completely paved new, the other that, that's not. And honestly, that contributes to issues even long, would contribute long-term for us just with how you'd blend those surfaces, the new with the old. My concern is this, I one, I'm gonna, I want to make sure I'm on record. I do think, you know, from, you know, covering our, our fair share of the cost is important, but I think before we commit to a dollar figure, I do think we need to share with them, hey, here's the, here's the cost that we've already expended. You, twice we've paved, we're unsure of when the last time was you paved because quite frankly, we could argue that there was some benefit that we've provided them that hasn't been matched on the other section of the roadway that they have maintained. So, you know, that all being said, I think in an immediate until, until it's like a netty net even, I, I don't know if we come off of any money. I'm just throwing this out for discussion. It's just my thought. Once we're at a point where it's even, okay, we can, we can find a way to do that cost sharing. But I think one of those underlying elements too is whose road maintenance standards are, are they gonna be adhere, adhered to from the aspect of the quality of the paving material and so forth. And this isn't intended to be a dig at Canton Township, but their, their road budget is a fraction of what ours is. And, you know, they face the trustees down there. I don't envy them. They, they have a, a difficult time, you know, getting some of the additional resources to, pa you know, pass to be able to do some of that, you know, they've started to pick up more miles within the last couple of years, but it's chip and seal plain township. We don't chip and seal. We've been paving. We've tried some micro surfacing, but just some thoughts. I'll shut up now. One more quick thing, Scott. We have those agreements with other townships. We have an agreement with Lake Township on Mount Pleasant, and we have an agreement with Nemesillon Township on Bentler. And it, it's always been we maintain a certain you know distance from one to the other, both lanes, and they have the same, and they've always paved and, and fixed signs or whatever needed done with both those other townships. So this isn't something irregular yeah. for us to have. Yeah.
I just think that, uh, you know, if we do have those agreements, uh, well, I, I know we have those agreements with other townships. Uh, I'm not 100% certain how that unfolds when it comes to the actual paving process versus plowing. Uh, but e either way, you don't want to do half a road regardless of what happens. So you have to have some consistency in who is going to be responsible for what. Uh, so I know Bentler is that way. Uh, so would it be fair to say, Joe, that um, Nimishillen would keep up a timing consistent to ours that if we were to blacktop what we have considered to be our half, that they have equally done the same thing? Is that a fair assessment? Yes, yes it is. Okay. And and John, can I, I just want to add a little more context. I don't know if you were on the board yet, but remember um, – Bentler with how the road was getting washed out because of the ditch, the count, the county come in. And honestly, we did, I'd approach Nimishillen Township about even part of the cost sharing and some of the aggregate and stuff to help with that through there. So they've been very good from my, my perspective on anything. We also have an agreement with Jackson on Wise Avenue. One year we take care of it, one year they take care of it, snow removal wise. And paving is the same thing. When that date comes up, one time we pave it, the next time they pave it. So uh, it, it's something, you know, just another township we have that agreement with. And the center we line, know. our corporation line, it, you have to, I don't see any other way to do it. We know, um, do we know what shape 17th on? Canton Township side is in relation to when it's going to be ready for a resurfacing. Well, I, I do believe they're thinking about doing it this year. Um, it is in dire need of it, John. Okay. Patch on top of patch. You know, it's pretty bumpy. But the way I understood it through their public works director, they wanted to do it this year. Did, did he approach us? Originally, he approached me, and then I think uh, Mr. Nichols approached you, Scott. Yes. Okay. And their road superintendent has all those figures and the data that you presented to us regarding how many times we paved what we agreed to be responsible for. No, I, have, I haven't sent that to him yet. Though. Our original conversation was about the agreement, and I gave him that send him a copy of that handshake agreement. Okay. So I, I guess on that note, I think the first step is at least we, sh we, we call out or we provide those details to, the, to them. Joe, I don't know if you want to start with that directly with the road superintendent or their public works guy down there. I can have the follow-up conversation with um, Chris and Ma and Mark is a uh, preemptive he heads up that, hey, we've, cr we've crunched some of these numbers. We're gonna be following with them. There's a couple details that really need to yeah, be- I can through. contact him tomorrow, that's not a problem. And we can talk on our end out. You wanna talk with the other board members from your end. Okay. Even if we just catch up now to what we have expended compared to what they have expended and then come to a known agreement that regardless of who does which end next, we'll share the cost in that. That way we're not paying more or they're not paying more. And by sharing the cost, whatever, you know, we do both sides on the East side. Uh, that's going to be a 50, 50 split, regardless of how long or how short it is. Same thing on the other side. So and if I, we come to that kind of agreement, that'd be the easiest way to do it. I think if that's, yeah. That's the kind of agreement that both boards are want. That's fine with us too. I, I just think from a specul speculative aspect, even they have some improved funding down, down there. I mean, last time public information was posted on life cycle replacement, their poor roads down there were somewhere between 25 and I think 32, 32 years for a replacement life cycle. And essentially right now with where we're at, 
Joe, what's it been the last four years now? We've been hitting right about 17 miles. We're hitting almost 10% of our roadway. So we're almost a 10 year replacement cycle. Correct. What I don't want to get in. We're between 10 and 12 right now. So. Yeah. My concern is I don't want to put the cart too far before the horse, but I would rather some of these details be spelled out with, with them and that, okay, they have to be prepared. Plain Townships keep them with a 10 to 12 year cycle, assuming fun, funding, you know, allows, they're, they're going to have to be able to come up with that, you know, money ahead of time. And I think with how we score the roads and we track that and stuff, I don't think it's unreasonable for if they were to ask, hey, we're going to need some advance, advance notice. I mean, going from one year into the next, I mean, we're always on top, always on top of it. But I think spelling out the frequency, you know, and so forth, because I don't want them coming back to us going, hey, we can't, we can't, you know, do it, do it this year. And then it gets into, maybe we can swap this, or maybe we can pay, pay this back later. I want to know that it's pay, it's paid and we're not running, you know, it's not a line of credit one way, one way or another, but yet we're still being good local stewards and collaborators with a fellow township. I just think some of it needs spelled out. I agree with hey, you. Hey, Joe, would it be fair to say that the east side probably gets more heavier vehicle traffic because of Hall of Fame going in and out from that side versus the neighborhood side going west? Uh, my, my guess would be yes, John. Between that and McKinley High School, you got a lot of yeah. traffic there too. So, and as the Hall of Fame continues to grow, I'm sure there's going to be more traffic there. The other one's just a little rural, you know, a little urban road that uh, cuts between two major roads. Yeah, I would, I mean, just even that short a distance, I would assume there's a lot more traffic going the other direction than going west. I agree. Yes, most definitely. So, Joe, you've, you've got the direction you need for right now to move forward, at least with conveying the, the figures and so forth with Canton Road Superintendent and then bringing any details back to us for any other arrangement. I'm assuming the next piece would be once we, the, any type of written agreement, we'll need Mr. Eric Williams to use his handy legal work to get something in writing because I'm definitely not a fan of the handshake agreement. I Even though we've got a piece of paper that says from former law director Richard Kuhn saying, yep, we have some type of handshake agreement, but again, the details are really sort of out there. That's, that's not good. That's not peace of mind. We need to be able to manage the what's the known. So... Yeah, and I think we, we need to probably do that wherever we have handshake agreements. I think it's, it's just something we ought to button up while we're at it. Because I know we've got some of those out there with different other entities. Um, and so if at some point uh, somebody could, whether that's Joe or the somebody from the board or whatever, could get me a list of those, I'd be happy to start putting something together so we can memorialize those so we're not caught off guard by any. Eric, I'm not even... I think Joe, Other you see agreements that we actually have that states what's getting taken care of. Okay, good. That that's good to hear. Any any other questions or comments on this topic? Okay. John or Brooke, anything under concerns of trustees? Are you good? Yes. Let's see here. That'll take us to concerns of the fiscal officer, Mr. Wolf. No concerns. Okay. It's going to take us to the approval of the minutes for January 26, 2021. I will so move. I'll second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. Okay, we do have a need for executive session, so I'm going to make a motion to be hereby resolved by the Plain Township Board of Trustees, Stark County, Ohio, 
to adjourn to executive session at 7.05 p.m. from this regular meeting is authorized under Ohio Revised Code 121.22G for the purpose of consideration of 1F, compensation of a public employer official, 2A, the purchase of real, personal, tangible, or intangible property, and 7A. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. I'll make a motion to return from executive session at 8.26 p.m. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. There are no announcements from executive session. I'll make a motion that we adjourn from this regular meeting at 8.26 p.m. I'll second it. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Sabo? Yes. Mrs. Harless? Yes. 